The story of Dior is that of Christian Dior. It is also the story of his successors. In their time, their moment, their Dior age. Episode 5, The Dior Age of Raf Simmons. What on earth had I let myself in for? I had gone too far to turn back now. On my side, my intransigence arose not from conceit, but from a secret unacknowledged desire to escape the whole thing. It led me to send a telegram breaking off negotiations completely. So Christian Dior wrote in Dior by Dior, his autobiography published in 1956, a year before his death. Raph Simmons had started reading this book when he arrived at Dior, but dropped it at the end of the first chapter, when Christian Dior admitted that he very nearly gave up before signing with Marcel Boussac and founding the House of Dior. Raph Simmons recognized the reflection of his own hesitations before accepting the role. The idea of stepping into Christian Dior's shoes gave him a lot of food for thought. How to measure up, to take on the legacy, how to be, paraphrasing the autobiography's French title, both Christian Dior and oneself, and start the next installment of this long and tumultuous story. John Galliano's dramatic departure was still fresh in everyone's memory. John Galliano, John Galliano flees the cameras, the paparazzi. The image is fleeting, that of premieres, that of fashion shows. But here we are not in haute couture, in ready to wear, but rather in ready to judge. For a year, Bill Gayton, the studio director, had taken charge of designing the collections and ensuring the transition. But the appointment of a new creative director was imminent. But who might take over the position, one of the most coveted and feared at the same time? Rumours of possible successes were rife. A litany of names were bandied about before each eventually fell by the wayside. Until the day when there was only one name on everyone's lips. Raph Simmons. I remember I walked out of the room and I just started walking into Paris and I think I walked four kilometres. I think I couldn't think anymore. <laughs> It was a really weird experience, but very honored, very humble, but also very excited. It was hardly surprising that he would want to get some air, the air of Paris, which he would soon be breathing on a more permanent basis. He was leaving Milan and the Jill Sander label behind. The neo-retro, neo-new look designs of his last collection already seemed to herald his Dior future. The talks were over and it was now time to sign on the dotted line. Raph was ready for haute couture. I think I'd been thinking it over already for quite a while. I think that couture came already in my mind quite some years ago, even if I was not performing in that world. I think in relation to what uh, ready-to-wear became, you know, the whole idea of what fashion became and uh, extremely mass-produced attitude and the amount of product that we consume and deliver in uh, high fashion and ready-to-wear made me think about how women would eventually approach high fashion in the future. In its press release, the Avenue Montaigne House announced that it was enthusiastically welcoming Raph Simmons, one of the greatest contemporary talents to continue the work of its founder. The news broke at 7 p.m. on April the 9th, 2012. It was a Monday, Easter Monday, and the symbolism of resurrection was in the air. Raph Simmons was revealed as John Galliano's successor. This sequel promised to be very interesting indeed. How might the designer from Antwerp, regarded as a minimalist, interpret Dior and its powerful femininity? I was, let's say, more avant-garde oriented men's designer. And then I went to Jill, which is a very, very minimalist house. So it was also my responsibility to be minimalist. But I think the audience could see that I was already kind of trying to escape from minimalism. And I just do not like to be defined as a minimalist because I am not only a minimalist. Do I like minimalism? Yes. Is it the only thing that I like? Not at all. To know Raf Simmons requires going back to 1995 and his first fashion show, his first men's collection. 35 looks worn by pale and lanky youths the aesthetic was adolescent, androgynous and skinny, the opposite of what was then considered the benchmark for male beauty. It was his own radical manifesto, anti-fashion, an unmistakable air of youth and rebellion, arriving in the wake of another brilliant Belgian designer, 
Martin Margiela. The reason why I decided to be in fashion was the third show from Martin Margiela, which was the first fashion show I ever saw in my life. And it's actually that moment in time, that moment when I left that show, I said, I will do fashion. But I never told anybody for years until I started. An industrial design graduate, he decided to make the move into fashion, encouraged by Linda Lopper, head of the fashion department at the Royal Academy of Fine Arts in Antwerp. She introduced him to her tailor father, from whom Raff learned how to cut and thus gained the necessary tools to invent a resolutely different uniform, ushering in a whole new kind of menswear at the dawn of the 21st century. In 2005, he took over the creative direction for men and women at Jill Sander. He was being described as a minimalist, but he was first and foremost a modernist, a nuanced difference. I'm not trained as a fashion designer, so I only started looking at the history of fashion quite late. And when I started doing that, you know, while I was working in Jill, I find the period that Monsieur Christian Dior was working the most impressive. Because I think that the body of work is never done before in a time span of 10 years. Lancé en 1947, son new look, qui allongeait les robes de 20 Launched in 1947, his new look, which lengthened dresses by 20 centimeters, soon set the standard in America and the rest of the world. He was dubbed the Pope of Couture. 47, 57. For me, it's a very romantic moment in time if you think over the development of creation and aesthetics. It was modern, at the same time romantic. People were kind of really looking forward to what the future could bring. It is in this vision of a simultaneously modern and romantic future, Raph Simmons found parallels between himself and Christian Dior in his day. The new look of 1947 was a totally new aspiration, a reaction to fashion during the occupation. It was the sartorial expression of liberation and revolution. 65 years later, in 2012, Raff provided the new look with a pragmatic reformulation. A radical and necessary changing of the guard was underway. It marks the beginning of a new story and the end of fairy tales. With Raff Simmons, fashion was not fantasy, it was reality. Nobody will be able to say that's a story or that's the concept. It's not about that. It's about how I see the old woman today. So it's not about we did a trip to Egypt and everything looks Egypt or, you know, because it's too theatrical for me. And I don't think that women are interested in that today. I don't think that women are interested in walking around with, a, with an amount of fabric on the body that they cannot move anymore. And that's what this one is about. I want to make it very dynamic. Like Gianfranco Ferre and John Galliano before him, Raph Simmons began by immersing himself in the archives, examining Christian Dior's original designs, both right side out and inside out. He scrutinized the architecture. The construction of clothing had changed so much in the intervening years as women's bodies had been liberated. And so Raph began the process of thinking how to make this fabulous past relevant today, how to sharpen it, how to make it modern. People think always about the new look, you know, like the bar jacket and the full skirt, which was then also, because that's so cliché to see it like that, I also wanted to see that as a challenge to see how can I be innovative with that? How can I make that modern again? But besides that, there was so much more work that I like, like, you know, like the trapeze and the linea ha and all that. There was so much more. The Esther dress, for example. It had been conceived for soirees way back in 1952. A magnificent bustier dress, in tulle embroidered with velvet and sequins in a manner no longer done. And so it made no sense to simply redo the Esther. It had to be rethought. Why not translate it as a top instead? That was modern. And with this statement, Raff reworked the Dior heritage, pairing it with pants, hands slipped into the pockets. I think my hand is there, but I also really wanted to have the hand of Monsieur Christian Dior there. I think that I was very interested to go back to very recognizable Christian Dior shapes. And I was picking up also on a lot of gestures that he did. In October 2015, Raf Simmons announced his departure. 
after three years and 18 collections from Haute Couture to Ready to Wear, stating that he wished to focus on his own label. But this left the House of Dior without a successor. A new period of transition began. And the studio team, headed by Lucie Meyer and Serge Ruffieux, took over in the interim, pending the appointment of a future creative director. And why not a female creative director this time? The future would tell. This podcast was brought to you by Maison Dior. Discover the world the house encompasses, from haute couture collections to perfumes, by subscribing to the Dior podcast, available on all audio streaming platforms.